Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, before actually uh, Ian introduces the uh, today's guest speaker, I would like to talk to you about the uh, next coming event that we have uh, as a speakers uh, series here in the college. On April 9, we will have construction symposium. By the way, I'm Dr. Gunhan, construction science professor here in the college. Uh, I'm assuming majority of you are architecture students. You may not know me. So we are going to host the uh, construction symposium on April 9. There will be six speakers, uh, which all of them are the founding members of Construction Industry Advisory Council of UTSA. And um, they are executive members of our council. Also, uh, they will be speaking about the uh, recent developments here in San Antonio. Uh, at the same time, new exciting development in San Antonio as well as the uh, South Texas region. I hope uh, you will join us and be part of this exciting uh, symposium on April 9. Having said that, I'm handing over to Ian. He will introduce our uh, today's guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Swat. Uh, my name is Ian Kane, and I'm an assistant professor here in the College of Architecture. And it's my great pleasure this evening uh, to introduce uh, Andrew Bernheimer. Uh, he's the sole principal in the award-winning firm of Bernheimer Architecture. Uh, he's also uh, the director of the Parsons New School for Design in New York City. Uh, as director of the MARC program, uh, Bernheimer oversees a curriculum known for its uh, not only design excellence, but also uh, theoretical uh, inquiries and the connection between theory and practice. Uh, on the professional side, uh, Bernheimer's design portfolio focuses on the New York landscape, the robust urban landscape of New York, and it sp spans a wide array of building, uh, built and theoretical work. Uh, a few of his best known projects include the R House. This is a certified passive house in Syracuse, New York. Uh, it was completed in collaboration with Architectural Research Office, also of New York City. Uh, he's also responsible for the renovation of a legendary architect Paul Rudolph's uh, penthouse apartment and office uh, in New York City. And this project received an honor award from AIA New York, not a small feat. Uh, his work has garnered countless awards. Uh, it's published widely in top journals such as Architectural Records, uh, Metropolis, Architectural Review, the Architects newspaper as well, just to name a few. Uh, the work of his previous firm, De La Valle Bernheimer, was the topic of a 2009 uh, monograph from the Princeton uh, Architectural Press entitled Think Make, and the volume chronicles the first decade of work from the prodigious firm. But before I turn things over to Andy, and that, that's kind of the, the facts and the figures, uh, I wanted to tell you that his work actually is meaningful to me uh, in a slightly different way, and it's slightly esoteric, and allow me to explain. Uh, years ago, uh, Andy, uh, Jared De La Valle, his former partner, and I all crossed paths uh, at Washington University in the EMARC program. And uh, very shortly after graduation, both Andy and Jared entered a competition, uh, won it, and ended up building a beautiful plaza in the middle of San Francisco. Um, now, this turn of events was clearly important for Andy and for Jared as it launched their firm and career. Uh, but on a smaller level, it was important for me because it taught me a critical lesson. Uh, namely that it was indeed possible to achieve big things at an early age. Uh, in fact, I did not know that uh, until Andy and Jared uh, did that. Um, so this spirit of optimism uh, is something I believe is critical for all young designers, and I think it's something that we all need to cultivate uh, at an early age. Uh, and this is a message I would like to impart to our own student body here at UTSA, uh, that the work that you do every day, both in the studio uh, and in the first few years of your career, it really matters. Uh, and in fact, if you maximize your talents, uh, if you put yourself in a position to catch a break, and uh, it is indeed impossible to make a very sizable uh, impact at a very young age, as Andy did. So with that, I want to turn it over to Andy, and perhaps he can tell us how he did it. Andy? Okay, so thank you, Ian. Um, those are very kind words. Um, and thank you to UTSA for inviting me to speak here. Um, it's a really, it's a great privilege. Um, one of my own graduate students at Parsons uh, is a graduate of UTSA, and so it's really nice to be able to see um, 
what she speaks so glowingly of and where she went to school. So the title of this lecture is Stories and Buildings, and it's a title I chose because it's basically what my own research and my practice investigate. Um, there's like a tenuous overlap between those two things, and I don't want to over-intellectualize it. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what the connection is between those two things, um, and I think it's probably because I'm in the beginnings of a second practice, as Ian just described. Um, so hopefully over time, I'll be able to figure out what the real connection is between those stories and those buildings. Um, as Ian mentioned, I spent 15 years, you're wondering what this picture is, I'm sure, uh, 15 years working in very um, deep um, collaboration with Jared Della Valle, a classmate of mine at Wash U, and in, for the last couple of years as a sole practitioner. So um, a little background in this first slide and uh, a story which will be quick because it's losing its cultural relevance pretty fast. Uh, for those of you who are too young to know that this this represents Beavis and Butthead, uh, two cartoon characters. So some of you may know who Beavis and Butthead are. Well, when Jared and I entered this competition for the San Francisco Prize, uh, we received a phone call from the GSA and the curator of architecture at SF MoMA telling us we had won. And we missed it because in the days of answering machines, we chose to continue playing our Beavis and Butthead video game and ignored the phone call. A couple hours later, we went downstairs, we checked the messages, and we had been told on the machine that we had won the competition for this project. So that's kind of how our firm started over a, a game of Beavis and Butthead. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about a, a three projects um, from our, my prior firm. Uh, Jared and I, again, we went to school together. We made a pact over a keg of beer one night in St. Louis. Uh, Ian, I'm sure, remembers those conversations well. Um, that we would start a firm, uh, and we did. Uh, we had a wonderful practice um, that transitioned a couple of years ago into something else, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But the first project I want to talk about is 23 Beekman Place. And this story is about the history of architecture and the fears of young practitioners. So following the Plaza project, we kind of went back to what young practitioners do, which is they don't get much work. Um, you hope that a family member will hire you. You hope that a friend will hire you. And after a couple of years of working for other people while we had our own practice, we actually got a couple of projects through friends and family. But then we realized we kind of had to make connections. And one of those connections was through a builder that Jared knew, who actually had been working on this project with an architect who was fired. The owner bought this apartment. They didn't know who Paul Rudolph was, and Paul Rudolph, at least in, um, in the last several years, has become a, a kind of new, a new old icon of, of modernism um, and of, in this project, of a kind of vibrant New York City um, from the 1970s. Uh, this is his penthouse here on the top floor of a townhouse on the east side of Manhattan. This is one of Rudolph's brilliant drawings. Uh, a section drawing, but uh, again, a drawing type he was famous for. And the owner had purchased this apartment after 9-11 from an owner who had purchased it from Rudolph after his death from his estate and had made changes to it, hired an architect, then fired the architect. The client of ours did not know who Paul Rudolph was. He had no idea what this apartment was, but he thought it was kind of cool, and he bought it, and he tore it apart, this is the, the apartment from the outside. It's, again, this kind of a, a barnacle on top of a townhouse. And this is the apartment that Rudolph made. It was both his home and his studio. Uh, an amazing, amazing space, um, kind of kaleidoscopic, uh, vertiginous, um, layers upon layers of uh, levels, about 25 different levels, uh, beams covered in mylar film to make them look like chrome. And when we walked into the space at the behest of the contractor, we saw what was on the right. And we saw on the left the original and on the right what we walked into. On the left, his bedroom. On the right, the space as we saw it when we walked into it. And so Jared and I had a long discussion about what to do, um, about whether we even wanted to take this project on. Because as young practitioners trying to make a name for yourself in New York, the last thing you want to do is be associated with the destruction of an icon within the city in which you work. And so we sat for a while. We, we actually, quite for several minutes, 
at least maybe several times that, sat on the steps in one of the remaining stairwells that was still there, sat and talked about what it meant to do a project like this. And I think arrogantly, um, maybe naively, we felt like it was something we kind of had to do. We were going to risk the wrath of this, some of the historians in New York City. We were going to risk maybe being the people who were told, maybe unfairly, that we had destroyed it because it had already been kind of wrecked itself. But we, we took it on. Um, and we asked the client to pause um, for us to get familiar with this. We didn't know Rudolph um, that well ourselves, though we knew of the project. And it was also one of the first projects that we used the computer. So um, I finished graduate school in 1994. I never took a computer class. So 20 years ago, we weren't learning on the computer. In 2004, 2005, when we took this on, we still hadn't really folded the computer in too much to our practice. But this apartment was so complex that we had to. On the left, are, uh, uh, these are the visualizations that we did in the office to understand the space. Because we couldn't build a model. We couldn't cut sections that were clear. We couldn't explain it to ourselves without using the device of the computer. And it was a good crash course in, in how to think architecturally through that tool. On the right, you see a front desk. And then this is the manifestation of the renovation of this space. On the left, an image of our design process. And on the right, an image of the finished space. So you end up with this in this apartment, new things, air conditioning, recessed lighting, sprinklers. There's a sprinkler, let's see if I can do this right. There's a sprinkler that runs up here, over and around, and then down, and then out. And that's the type of stuff that wasn't there anymore that we had to redesign in the spirit of Rudolph. And this com the computer was actually a device to do that. Another one of the spaces, and some of the drawings that we did to make this happen. Spaces in which you see up and down through glass floors. Uh, it's a place that you trip constantly within. That's not my fault. That's Rudolph's fault. <laughs> on the left, the drawing uh, during the design process, and on the, on the right, the final space. And on, uh, here we have the main atrium. In this, in this photograph, you see some of the linear slot diffusers that we had to squeeze in without violating the architecture. And one of the favorite moments of the project, Rudolph had designed a glass bathtub over his kitchen. It's a very famous thing, a glass bathtub over his kitchen. And that had been removed. It had been demolished and taken out. So we couldn't convince the new owner to do a glass bathtub over his kitchen. But we did create a kind of sink which fills up his tub, which opens up to his bedroom. And so that kind of openness was something that happened within the bounds of the bedroom. So that's a project where we kind of learned about the history of New York City in a way about the modern architecture of New York City, and learned also about maybe taking some chances. This is a New York City black and white cookie. And I only show this because it kind of looks like the building we designed, which is also in New York. Um, a story about this project. Uh, Jared and I were impatient. And so we realized that no one was going to hire us uh, unless we had a lot of experience, which we didn't have. So Jared got interested in real estate development. And now Jared is actually an architect and a real estate developer. And in line one day at Kinko's, and Kinko's is, again, as time goes on, realize that these references don't make any sense to some people who are a lot younger than me. Kinko's is a place where we would take our drawings to get copies made or send faxes. Like you had to go a place to send a fax. A fax is you put a paper in a machine. And, it, <laughs> and standing in line one day, Jared overheard a couple of guys talking about real estate development and struck up a conversation. And within about a month, we had applied for a city project together as real estate developers and as architects. We won it. And then this led to Jared pursuing more real estate development. And this project was the first project that he did as a developer that we designed collaboratively as architects. So it's on the High Line in New York City. Um, this was designed in 2006. So that gray line is the High Line Park which runs through West Chelsea in New York City. And that is our site. Um, and this project, to go through relatively quickly, was really a manifestation of New York City zoning code. And so New York has some strange rules about what you can do within setbacks at certain heights. And the building is prescribed quite heavily by the code. And so in this case, we just decided to embrace it. And so what you actually have in, a sh in the shape of the building is simply the maximum for real estate purposes, the maximum envelope that you can create by building code. 
And then at that point, it was a question of composition, uh, investigating materials, trying to create a building that wasn't all glass, but that had a lot of openness. So we researched and found a place uh, that made expansive pieces of panoramic glass. Those pieces of glass came to Long Island, actually, where they were assembled into wall panels. And then the wall panels went up by crane and clad the building in the course of about two weeks. So we went from a steel frame to an enclosed building in about two weeks. And this is the view of the building from the High Line. The penthouse. We architects can afford to design these spaces, and we cannot afford to live in them. <laughs> Another view of the, this is the area in the sloped area, which is the prescribed New York City zoning envelope. It tells you that in the setback, which is at this moment, you can obstruct the setback, but only if you create a diagonal plane which recedes in scale as you go upward. And so we just drew that line, and that became the building. So the next project, and one of the final projects that Jared and I did together and that Ian mentioned before, which is called Our House. So Our House is a project that we won in a competition, and this was a small competition of just uh, five firms. We did it in collaboration with a firm called Architecture Research Office. Now, we started this project, it was in 2009, and we were very excited, and we started the research, and these are some of the study models. Uh, we had a first meeting, um, kick it off with about four, four people, maybe two of us from my firm and two of us, two from ARO, and then this happened. So in 2009, the, the market crashed, um, Lehman crashed, Bear Stearns crashed, and our firms, which were doing a significant amount of development-related work, suffered greatly. So we had this meeting with four people, then this happened, then we had a second meeting. And in the meantime, since we had lost projects thanks to the economy crashing, we put everyone on, in our offices on this project. And at our second meeting, we had about 15 people working on a house that was 1,000 square feet. And that was because, the, sadly, the people who were all working on it didn't know that they were about to be laid off. And we didn't want to lay them off yet because it was so sudden and we didn't know how to do it, frankly. So we all worked on the research of this project. At the next meeting, we were back down to four or five people, quite literally for the entirety of our firms. So um, it was a lesson, uh, in a way, of learning how to run a business. Um, one of the most difficult times um, I think any of us have ever had. But the result was a tremendous amount of research in a short amount of time which looked at passive house technology and how to build a really um, kind of uh, hyper sustainable house, but not just from the standpoint of energy use, but also from economics. So in an area in Syracuse called the Near West Side, which is full of dilapidated old houses, um, an incredibly depressed uh, real estate market. It was about looking at local context, local form, and thinking about how we could kind of simply push a ridge line to build a small house affordably, but give us flexibility. At the same time, building in ideas of the passive house, which involves recovering energy that's produced by the house, passive solar use to heat the floor. In Syracuse, has a relatively harsh environment, so using the sun to heat in the winter and let warm air radiate. And then also to primarily to super insulate the house to create an incredibly tight barrier so that air exchange is limited and controlled and that the house doesn't need so much energy. And so on the right you see the energy use of the passive house versus on the left the typical house in this say, area of, of Syracuse. And the house is incredibly compact. It can be partitioned to accommodate different families, family structures. Uh, and this kind of showed both an idea of economic sustainability as well as environmental sustainability. So a small house of just a thousand square feet, square feet can accommodate a couple, it can accommodate a, an apartment with a rental unit, it can accommodate a family of four, or a couple with a, an in-law. And some images of the house. The super insulation, it's about 18 inches thick, the wall structure, and a very simple, again, very, very inexpensive house made with corrugated metal, shifting the ridge line just to play with the vernacular of the local neighborhood. And you end up with very selective window punches because you're controlling the solar influx. And so you have a lot of light on the south, not so much on the north, but you end up with bright, airy spaces just by being very, very surgical and very, very careful about where you put these windows. The real star of the house is this guy, which is the energy recovery, the, the ERV, the ventilating machine that recovers the heat from the systems to feed back into the house. 
Okay. So those were the projects that Jared and I, that's the project that Jared and I kind of concluded on. Um, at the same time, the economy crashed, obviously, and I had like nothing to do. I, I, mean, I really had like nothing. I, it's not, I had nothing to do. I would go to work and I'd sit there in a big office space and I, I wouldn't have anything to do. Um, so you, again, you, this is when you start working with your family again, right? So my sister is a writer um, and scholar, and she writes, she writes fairy tales. She edits um, a fairy tale, uh, an academic journal about fairy tales. She teaches at the University of Arizona. And we always had, we had talked for a while about doing something together, and so Kate and I had this idea where we would do this thing called fairy tale architecture. So, you know, when you have no clients, you just, you start, you read fairy tales and you start drawing fairy tales, and you start working with your sister. So, this, this is a project that we did, and this has become a little bit of a, a, a kind of a recurring project for us. Um, the first project that we decided to do, and, and Kate is the kind of impetus behind suggesting stories um, from which we would draw architecture. Um, this is a story called Baba Yaga, um, and it's the story of, of a witch who lives in the woods who eats little girls. Um, fairy tales are, are quite regularly um, violent, um, dark, um, they're not Disney, they're difficult to read. Um, but this story was interesting because it has a very literal figure of architecture in it, which is this house on chicken feet. So one of the lines from the story, now deep in this forest, as the stepmother well knew, there are always evil stepmothers, which is not fair, there was a green lawn, and on the lawn stood a miserable little hut on hen's legs, where lived a certain Baba Yaga, an old witch grandmother. She lived alone, and none dared go near the hut, for she ate people as one eats chickens. So I told Kate that this was a good story and that I would draw it. Um, and so my first instinct was to kind of create a client, because I had no clients. So I made the witch into my client, and I wrote down things like, what kind of range does she want? Cooktop, <laughs> stove, I think I said stove, cellar. And it was pulled from the story. So it was like this kind of fun exercise in my free time, my big free time, to kind of design this house. The house spins. The house has an orientation. And so this was really the first kind of investigation into how the literary could shape the architectural. An early sketch of the house kind of spinning, the chicken feet abstracted. There was a fence of skeletons around it, which I chose not to embrace as part of the architecture. And this is the kind of resulting design. Um, the story I wrote myself to kind of combine with it is it's a Russian fairy tale. So the idea of the house in which, which the, sun in the, the sun rises and sets in the form of two knights or two horse riders that fly over became a flight path into a Russian airport. The house spinning in this opening in the woods. The witch who flies into the house, that's the witch from the Wizard of Oz, collaged into the, chick, the house on chicken feet, a kind of gangly structure that acts as the legs um, in a pivoting kind of uh, bearing on which the house spins, a kind of skin of bark which becomes feather-like. So these are the drawings that I did, again, in my free time, um, but which started to kind of inform this deeper kind of look into what the literary could offer to architecture, a collage of a plane, the plane flying over the house on chicken feet. So that's my first project with one of my sisters. I have three sisters, so. I've done lots of work with sisters. Um, my other sister in Los Angeles had a wine store, um, or she had a wine business online, and she decided that she was going to open a, a wine store. So she said, will you design my wine store? And I said, sure. And I said, um, and she said, how much does it cost to build a wine store? And I said, um, this much. And she said, can I pay you in wine? And, and I, I said, OK, even though I needed fee. I needed fee. I didn't need wine. Um, wine was the least of my problems. I can get cheap wine. I just couldn't get fee. But she paid me, she paid me in like two cases of wine. In retrospect, it was a terrible deal for me. Um, <laughs> but this is a, a story of, of her wine store. And this is a, a, a project, um, again, coming out of the economic kind of downturn, that was an opportunity for me to kind of engage one of my favorite spaces in New York City, which is the lobby of the Whitney Museum by Marcel Breuer, which has these wonderful kind of strangely shallow domed light fixtures throughout the lobby. 
Um, and this is, I think, also a, a, maybe a story about architectural inspiration. Um, when I was in school, and, and Ian may have had a similar experience, one of our teachers was very much against looking at other projects. There's Adrian. And I had a drawing by an architect up on my desk, and he came as, I can't do an Argentinian accent, but he came over and said, take, the, take that bullshit off the wall. <laughs> and I said no, because I was an arrogant student, and I left it there. But I, I remember that actually because, I remember that quite vividly because I didn't want to kind of not look at other architects. And this was um, something that I still tell my own students that, you know, actually looking at good projects is useful. It's not something that we should, we can't all be so original. We have to look for inspiration to other people. So this was a chance to kind of look at a space, partly because my sister had absolutely no budget. Um, and I had to figure out what the opportunity in the store was because she had to pay for wine racks and wine racks are expensive. And once you pay for the wine racks, you can't pay for any architecture. Um, so I started to think about what could I do. So one of my ideas was to get sequins, because sequins are cheap, and then put sequins all over the ceiling of her store, like little grapes. But she didn't want a sequined store. Um, and I couldn't, my sister's a little stubborn, um, but she was probably right. The next idea, which I, she, I had to convince her of, was to kind of create this kind of bundle, this kind of hanging vine of grapes, um, which we realized in the office that the opportunity was in the ceiling. So because we couldn't do much with wine racks and because she had to kind of pack all the walls out, the opportunity was in the ceiling. And so we proposed to her to do a series of light fixtures throughout the store that would become like slices of metaphorically grapes, green, uh, rather purple like grapes, even though a lot of grapes are green. Um, and we proposed doing 48 of these. So she had a little bit of a, a fit about how am I possibly going to afford 48 light fixtures in my store? And so we went online and we found a place in Illinois that could manufacture 36 inch spun hemispheres out of aluminum and paint them in three different shades of purple um, for about $5,000. Um, and this is what her store became. So the, the center section was kind of a social area because she, has, she had aims at the very outset of creating kind of a place for learning about wine a place where she could actually bring chefs in, they could actually serve food, and she could actually have classes. Um, that was her, very, her aspiration at the, at the very beginning. So we actually left a lot of the space of the wine store open with a strip of uh, blackboard paint so she could move the wine around the store, and that the lights would become kind of the shelter over the center space. And her wine store is going very, really well. She actually does exactly what she anticipated doing with classes and, and tastings. Um, and this, the store has a, a great social vibe. And this was the way that I could finally get to do my own little purple Whitney ceiling. Um, and then another project which came out of that. Um, so this is where I'm beginning to kind of maybe build my own firm a little bit. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to go through 15 years of working with someone where you share authorship of everything. When you start off on your own, you can go back to all those projects, but those projects were always associated with Jared and me. And so people might, and Ian asked me this before, like how did you differentiate what you did? And I couldn't really, because I could only point to the stuff that we had done together, not the stuff that I had done on my own. So these are the very beginnings of me being able to do things on my own, which is pretty scary um, after being kind of conjoined with someone for a long time. This is another store in Los Angeles. So the store that I did in Los Angeles in a way led to another store in Los Angeles, but this for friends of mine in New York City who sell skincare products. Um, and they were getting a space uh, in Los Angeles, quite close to where my sister lives, and very simply, a small boutique. Um, they have a really strong graphic design already on their product, and they want a background for their product. So we created two walls of cabinetry. This is back of house space, another wall with minimal cabinetry, and a piece of furniture. And that's really all the project was about. And creating a kind of a new facade. So we got rid of an existing opening and made a single opening into the store. And then the store itself becomes basically shelving. It's all shelving for their product. Um, letting the color of their product kind of um, show itself more, more uh, forward in more forward fashion. And they can move products around. They color code their products by type, depending on whether it's for your face or for your hands. And so they're able to program and reprogram this store based on their products. Again, a tight budget. Figuring out how to build the cabinetry so that it would be seamless was a challenge. And we had a, a, an amazing contractor. 
I should say that most of these projects are collaborative, not just within the office, but also with the people who build them. That's really important. And we had a good builder for this one. So just some snippets of this project. And these are small projects. So starting, basically kind of starting over again, you have small things to do. Um, and you make as much as you can out of the small things. A piece of furniture they found at an antique store that was a beautiful compliment. And the, the tracery of the lines is actually the kind of the inverse of the cabinetry on the other side of the store. So this is on one wall, and the lines, which are kind of um, uh, a drawing in a way, are just the drawing of the shelves that exist on the opposite side. So now the scale jumps a little bit, because I was invited um, to a comp another limited competition for a football practice facility in Syracuse, New York, um, up at, at Syracuse University. So this was a chance to kind of indulge uh, the sports fan side of me. I'm a big sports fan and try to figure out how to design a building for sports, which was kind of cool. Um, it was a big project. It's a football field, basically, enclosed by a shed. So it's a big project, but it's also a really simple project. Um, and so we started to look at patterns. And, and one thing I remember doing, um, to tell a little story about this one, is that I sat for about three hours trying to figure out the hang time and trajectory of, of punts for professionals versus punts for college, elite college football players. Because the exit velocity of a football off of a foot for a college punter is several miles an hour lower than a pro punter. And having gone to a couple of practice facilities in preparation for this project, I was allowed into the New York Jets practice facility, and shortly thereafter, the New England Patriots practice facility. And so I was able to see the, the rivals, the back of house rivals. They didn't even do like a security check. They said, come on in. There was like all the security equipment I could have, I guess I know how these teams find out what each other does. Um, so one of the things that the, the, the person who ran the Patriots facility told me is that the punters kept hitting the joists. Like that was during practice, during tryouts, when preseason, the punters would kick the ball and they would hit the lights or they would hit the joists. And so we found out that there was a certain height above which the building had to be so that punters and kickers could kick the ball so that they could run full plays and full practices. These are the things you just do not think about unless you ask these questions. So, but then there's a wrinkle, which is that college punters are not quite as good as pro punters, right? Pro punters are the best college punters. So the college punters don't kick it quite as high. But then we started to worry that we would make the building too low. And in Dallas, they had a problem with punters hitting a big television screen that I think you guys all probably know about. And so this became a little bit of a design factor. How do we come up with a building that can accommodate these things? The other thing was, how do you make just a shed into something that's really interesting? Because we wanted to do something interesting. That was our charge. It was a design competition. It wasn't a, a technical competition. It was design and solve the technical. So an early sketch. And then I'll come back to what this drawing is showing. I mean, this photograph is showing because this is a little bit, this is where we kind of got whimsical. But there were a series of studies of structural systems, different types of roofs that would allow us to actually gain the height that we would need. And what our structural engineer, a guy named Guy Nordenson, came up with was this kind of section, um, which at the bottom member of the, of the truss was just above the height of what a high-level college kicker could kick. So they could run full plays within this, within this structure. What that does is that you want to have that for the full width of the field. And that means that you have a lot of volume. So you have a lot of basically clear story around the edge of the facility. A person is only about this tall here. So you end up, because you want the, the volume to be basically unencumbered, it means that you design a very large box. The plan is simple. It's a football field. But one of the things that we read uh, was a quote by Vince Lombardi who said, he said, practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. So in that we read a kind of a reiteration of all the lines, the metering of football. Football is so heavily tactical and all about repetition than response to repetition. That structure lines up on 10 yard lines quite rigorously. All the systems of the buildings, the, the, the polycarbonate that wraps the outside has 
a metering which is related to the yard lines of the field. Again, it's just a box with a locker room. So this is where we had some fun. When we also saw a couple of facilities, we saw that uh, apparently quarterbacks and other players like to throw balls at the base, like they have uh, this kind of wainscoting around the building, and they're all dented. They're all dented with footballs, and, and they're just they're kind of they're kind of gross. They just get messed up. They're not they're not pretty. It's not pretty aging. It's it's kind of just a mess. And so we thought, well, what if we kind of do something? We preempt that. So we thought about precast concrete panels because our estimator told us that the base of the building would be best as uh, possibly best as a precast panel based on the parameters of the project. And so we thought, well, can we precast a panel? So for the competition, we built a panel. We cut some holes in it. We bought some footballs. We greased them up. And then we poured plaster in to make the impression of the football. And so that became an idea for the precasting of the base of the building. They would build one mold, basically. And then that would track its way around the bottom of the building. And so that was a, that was a little bit of a gesture, a kind of a joke to this idea that the players are going to end up doing this anyways. The building is really just this base of concrete with a, an upper level privileging uh, daylighting so that during the day they run practice, they, have, they can basically keep the lights off. On the left you see a, a render, actually a rendering from our office of, of the daylight condition. And on the right you can catch the faint hint of the lighting inside from a nighttime condition. There's the building in full. It's the building at night. The orange splash at the entry from Syracuse's colors. And alas, uh, we didn't win this competition. In fact, nobody won this competition. So they decided not to do this project until about a year ago, uh, or last year, they hired another architect entirely. So um, that was unfortunate. But at the same time, it gave me a chance to kind of establish um, a project which was larger than either a fairy tale or a wine shop. So another story that I did with my sister. This is a story by the Grimm brothers called The Boy Who Went Forth to Learn Fear. And this was um, a, a story that didn't, it had a lot of architectural spaces. Um, it had a lot of strange things that happened in this. It's about a boy who can't feel scared of anything, and so he goes out into the world to try to discover what it's like to shiver, basically. And he thinks that shivering is from being scared of something. And in the end, he realizes that he's not scared of anything, that he um, can endure anything. He's just shivering is from being cold. It's a weird story. Um, and in the story, there are things like animated half bodies, uh, skeletons, all sorts of things, bouncing beds. Um, one of the lines from the story says, the second night he again went up into the old castle, sat down by the fire, and once more began his old song. If I could but shudder. When midnight came, an uproar and noise of tumbling about was heard. At first it was low, but it grew louder and louder. Then it was quiet for a while, and at length, with a loud scream, half a man came down the chimney and fell before him. Hello, cried he. Another half belongs to this. This is too little. Then the uproar began again. There was a roaring and howling, and the other half fell down likewise. Wait, I will just blow up the fire for a little for thee. When he had done that and looked around again, the two pieces were joined together, and a frightful man was sitting in his place. And the boy, of course, is not scared of this. It's almost like laughable that this thing in half comes together. So we didn't know, I didn't know what to do with this story. Um, but it turns out that the Grimm brothers grew up in an area of, of, on, uh, in southwestern, midwestern Germany, uh, I believe in Bavaria, where there was a, a bombing run um, called the Edersee, Edersee Dam uh, bombing. It was quite a famous bombing in World War II. And the, the Allied planes used it. These are the things that we found out as we were trying to figure, I was trying to figure out what to do with this story. Um, should I draw chimneys with half-dead bodies in it? I didn't really know what the point of that was. I, wasn't, I didn't want to be an illustrator of stories, necessarily. That was part of the problem. I didn't just want to draw like what you would see in a children's book necessarily. So in the research, we found out that there was this idea of this bouncing bomb. And the bouncing bomb, actually, the plane would drop it, it would hit the water, it would skip across the water like a stone, it hit the dam, 
and then sunk, and then would detonate. And it, this is what they did to the, Edersay, the Allies did to the Edersay Dam. And this was right near, kind of, luckily in Quinsilla, near where the Grimm brothers had grown up. So the story and the drawings became actually the study of kind of hypothetical or fictional idea of what space was created for a young soldier, the boy who was trying to learn fear, who was stationed at the dam during the bombing. And so we started to look at the, the bouncing bombs and we kind of made up this idea that in fact the bomb explosion would create a kind of torqued space. And this was for me a, a way to kind of learn about spaces. As you could see, a lot of the buildings are rectilinear. And this was a kind of chance for me to, in a way, kind of test out form making purely, but using the story as the catalyst for it. So this is a drawing of a series of shapes we made in the office that became torqued, twisted, extruded, and then became a kind of pure form, simply drawn out of like the read, our reading of the story. Another drawing of that shape twisting and turning, and then ultimately, this is the kind of final form that we settled on for this story, which we then had 3D printed and turned into this kind of tornadic shape and a close-up of that, of that piece. So in a way, that story was not necessarily about architectural space in terms of drawing a house, like the house on chicken feet, but it was about learning about the makings of form and the makings of shape, but doing it through the vessel of the story. OK, so for a little bit of time, while Jared and I had split apart our businesses, we did so very deliberately and we did so in a, in a very amicable fashion. And we shared office space for a while. But as time went on, it was really clear that I wanted my own office space. And so after about nine months of actually doing some of this solo work, but in the same space as Jared, I actually moved to this office. So this is my office in Brooklyn. It's just a little um, storefront on a, on a street, um, a main sort of commercial street in Brooklyn. And we sit there and we get people who walk in trying to sell us ukuleles and candy and all sorts of things. Um, and at about the same time, I was able to um, pursue teaching in a more significant fashion. I'd always taught as kind of an adjunct, um, but I applied for a job at Parsons um, for the directorship of the master's program. And I was very, very lucky to be selected for that. So for the last two years, I've worked as both um, a practitioner and as a teacher and administrator in a master's program. Um, and I just wanted to show you a couple of things because the practice that I have now that began a couple years ago and even before then with Jared has always also been looking at um, civic minded projects and especially um, housing, um, whether it's private residential housing or affordable housing. Jared and I did um, market rate condominiums. We did some affordable housing. Um, and my students um, in the first year studio um, this semester, in fact, the spring of the first year, we look at social housing. So I just wanted to show you a little bit of what we've been doing there. Really a couple of quick images. Um, this from last spring, two students looking at um, spaces in amongst uh, kind of modern towers in the park. Um, another project, we, we gave uh, students the space in between, this is New York City public housing. A lot of towers in the park, these kind of dog bone shaped buildings. And this is an empty uh, parking lot and we asked the students to use leftover development rights to envision new social housing in that space. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of the great things I think about being in New York is that you have um, context like this in which to, to work, not to experiment, but actually to have the students learn about the kind of really pragmatic issues that are facing, um, facing our city. This was heavily flooded by Hurricane Sandy. The, the residents in these buildings were without gas and water service for quite some time. Um, and the students are, are uh, sort of, they have to confront these real world issues. Um, this semester, we're looking at social housing again, but in Chelsea. Um, and we're, we're looking at these buildings. And unlike last year, where we, are actu we actually asked them to design a new building, this year we're looking at adaptation. So these buildings are aging infrastructure, um, housing this complex of 11 buildings ho houses over 2,000 people. And we're asking the students to kind of, this is the website for our studio, and we're asking students to each take a building and kind of examine it and cut it apart and adapt it. And so this is a quick little video of what they, where they were a few weeks ago as they each kind of work on a building creating a kind of an exquisite corpse assemblage. And they're starting to rein things in. So they started out by kind of just going crazy and like replacing basically. The idea of adaptation was replaced by just replacement. 
And now we're trying to get them back into looking at actually how to more surgically adapt the buildings. So that's another thing that the kind of the solo work has obviated was an ability to teach as well as practice. So a house. This is a house in Rhode Island. And this is for a client that I had when I was par uh, partnered with Jared and who I maintained as a client. Um, it's a house in a flood zone of Rhode Island, uh, also uh, code impacted by Hurricane Sandy, um, on a very, very difficult, strangely shaped lot. So the existing house is tiny um, and was relatively um, dysfunctional. Um, and so I wanted to show you a little bit about process um, as opposed to just kind of images that are finished. Um, this project was about trying to figure out how to deal with a very dysfunctional, small, non-compliant house. And so initial schemes were ideas of kind of using the existing structure and tacking on but staying within the footprint, but it didn't accommodate the client's program. These are drawings shown to the client early on. Uh, ideas about building a conforming house on the existing foundations that pushed itself out, kind of blew itself up over the foundation walls, to, but to still comply because once they decided to renovate the house, they had to comply with code, which caused all sorts of problems because the existing house was not compliant. And then the last option was to kind of build a new house, which was, um, I think, an easy way to kind of solve the problem. Um, it worked out well because uh, we could build a new house, um, but it also cleared the decks. We were able to make the house compliant. It meant pushing the house back into the throat of the trapezoid so it was in the setbacks, but it meant a very narrow house as well. And so it created a kind of a difficult proposition in terms of how to solve the actual planning of the house. And so here's the, the site plan as it was finally designed, but within that process was looking at this house which either followed the lot and start to push in to grab light. This is east and this is west and the water is over here. So the sun un goes like this, but this is a neighbor's house. So the views are this way. They're not so much this way and this way, but this is where the sun goes. So there was a little bit of a trickiness in this project that way. One other scheme was to kind of, sorry for the lightness of this, was to kind of pile up rooms and carve holes through the top of the house all the way down to the bottom of the house. And that's ultimately the scheme that kind of went forward. So it's a house that is a box. It's pushed far enough back so it complies with setbacks. And then openings are cut from the ceiling down to the lower floor to draw light in. The idea being that the sun rises over here and that sculpted forms embedded within the house would catch light in the morning coming this way and in the evening coming this way, which then led to a series of kind of dual skylights, which would kind of facet or bend to catch light at different times of the day. So the house became, in a way, kind of uh, not a real clock, but at least something which would change throughout the course of the day, change color, depending on the color of the sky, change shade, depending on the brightness of the sky or the darkness of the night. So this is the plan of the house, the op bottom open floor with cutouts for skylights, and then upstairs, one room, two room, three rooms. This is a skylight that cuts through the floor. This is open, this is open, this is open, and this is open. And so you end up with a section that really does this and it reduces the square footage in a way of the, of the house, though it doesn't necessarily change the amount of sheetrock. And then we did studies in the office, both out, both out of foam and also in the computer to understand what these skylights would do during the day. Skylight at, at um, the entry to the house, a main double skylight right near the stairs of the house. And then looking at the space of the house, one of the big skylights, and this begins to trace the rooms above as well. And then a rendering of the house as we saw it during the design phase. And this is the house under construction, so you can see the location of the skylights here, 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 here. And then the framing of the skylights. And this is where it really gets um, kind of fun because our builder did drawings of our drawings because he had to figure out the framing. So we did drawings of the framing, but then he redid them. And he did them, he drafted them. So in this day of digital manipulation, digital fabrication, digital everything, our builder drew in analog fashion 
every stud so he knew where light fixtures were going and how framing would come together. And then when he built it, he had no conflicts. So the pencil means a lot. This is the framing of the skylights, looking straight up from the ground floor. When you come in, you sit down and take off your shoes or your flip-flops. This is what you look up to see the sky. And this is the outside of the house. So the outside of the house is actually clad in a, a material um, called shusugiban, which is Japanese. It's a Japanese technique of charring cypress. Um, they burn it, they wire brush it, and oil it. And so it, it is supposed to weather. In fact, this comes from Texas. Um, and we found a, a, a mill in, in Austin called Delta Millworks that milled the, milled the cypress and shipped it to Rhode Island. So that's the entry to the house. This is my favorite. This is like the fairy tale moment, which is they have a temporary like Home Depot door, which is like six foot seven in what will be a 10 foot tall opening. This is the siding. It has a, a it's an open, an open siding. It's a rain screen. So in fact, we found a, a UV protected house wrap, which has no labels on it. So it's a black house wrap that's UV stable because otherwise it might fade. So you actually, and there's a negative pressurization so that driving rain actually won't get into the gaps through the slats. It's a rain screen in any case, so it doesn't really matter if water gets back there, but the owner was concerned about that. And this is a view from the water side. So this monumental opening faces to the bay. A view of the side of the house. This is Aaron from my office who has run this project. And I should acknowledge everybody in my office who, uh, because I teach and because I'm out of the office quite a bit, um, I have a really wonderful staff uh, who design, draw, manage, kind of do everything. Whoop. What is that? It's gone. Okay. View from the master bedroom. Another view of the master bedroom. And this, you can see what the vernacular of the neighborhood is. So we're a little weird. And then I received this photograph today, actually, from the contractor. And they put up the, sh they put up the sheetrock. I'm going to stop using this. They put up the sheetrock. And so that rendering, which we saw earlier, is now starting to turn into something real. OK. This is a story about making sure you read things. Um, this is a story by Hans Christian Andersen called The Little Match Girl. Um, the Little Match Girl is a very short fairy tale. Um, the fairy tale project kind of turned into a larger thing where I started asking fellow architects to design spaces. So colleagues in New York started contributing to the series, um, which if you go to the website Design Observer, you can see like six other collaborations with other architects. My sister would pick a story, and the other architects would draw it. Um, one firm did Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, one firm did The Library of Babel by Jorge Luis Borges. Um, not technically a fairy tale, but nonetheless a story. Um, and my sister, la about a year and a half ago, sent me this story called The Little Match Girl. So I started reading the story, and like three paragraphs in, I got to this passage. I didn't know the story. It's a pretty famous story, but I didn't know it. So this, the passage is this. She crept along, trembling with cold and hunger, a very picture of sorrow, the poor little thing. The flakes of snow covered her long, fair hair, which fell in beautiful curls around her neck. But that, of course, she never once now thought. From all the windows, the candles were gleaming, and it smelt so deliciously of roast goose, for you know it was New Year's Eve. Yes, of that she thought. So I thought, ah, candles and windows, winter, snow, I, I, can, I can draw this. This is no problem. So I, I kind of put it aside for a couple weeks, and a deadline was approaching from Design Observer to send them the drawings for this story, and I read the rest of it. And the rest of it is terrible. <laughs> the, girl, the girl is starving to death. She, she starts suffering from hypothermia. She starts seeing visions, and then she dies. And that's the story. She dies. And so I read it. I'm like, what am I going to I don't know how to draw this. I don't, I don't know what to do. So I was completely at a loss. I had no idea what to draw for the architecture of a story about a girl who dies from hypothermia. It wasn't, I, I said, I called my sister, I'm like, what did you send me this for? And she said, you, you read it, and you said you liked it, and it was great. I said, I, well, I didn't read it. <laughs> so so read, read stories to the end, 
if you're going to draw them. But in any case, so I thought and thought and thought, and I didn't know what to do. So I finally realized that um, there was this thing about the, the story's message is that there's release in death, and that the suffering that the girl went through was actually um, her journey to heaven. So there's a religious allegory in the story that her death is actually her ascent. Um, and then that's, what, that's why the story, Anderson considered the story quite beautiful, um, not tragic. For me, as the father of a seven-year-old girl, all I saw was like a dead little girl, and I couldn't get past that. Um, but I, I thought about this, and, and what realized is that there was this issue of this, the seeing through the frozen. Um, and, and now there's a very popular movie that my daughter likes called Frozen. Um, which is based on the Ice Queen, another Anderson story. But nonetheless, this is, so what I did was I froze, I froze water on a pan and put it, in my, I put it in my freezer and then I took it out of the pan and then I took photographs through it so that I could, I, I could see light passing through it. That was the kind of gleam of the candle and I, mo I isolated moments from the story. So I could see the structure of the ice as it froze in the freezer and then I could see what happens when light passed through the ice Again, trying to manifest the visions of the girl. At one moment, she sees a Christmas tree or Christmas lights, candles on a Christmas tree. And then the girl, in fact, becomes kind of encapsulated. So this was a semi-perverse way of getting my daughter into a photograph. So this is my daughter holding up a big piece of ice um, and seeing the little girl through the ice. And then at the end, kind of the frozen hand through the ice. Um, and so I don't know what the art, this is one where I'm not sure what the architecture is. Um, but I do know that I learned to read stories um, to the very end. Um, this has no story. This, this is the, a, a project that I'm going to show very quickly um, that is current work um, that is in the very beginning of design that we won with another firm for um, a building in the Brooklyn Academy of Music Cultural District in downtown Brooklyn. And it's a mixed-use, affordable, market-rating cultural facility um, in downtown Brooklyn. I just want to show this because as, the pro as my, my practice has, has moved forward, the scale of the product begins to change a little bit. Um, and so this is about uh, 100 apartments uh, in downtown Brooklyn, surrounded by theaters, actually, um, and in which, in the base, we have a, an arts, a cultural and arts facility. Um, so I just wanted to show a touch of what the firm is doing now. This is... Um, Hopefully, we'll be done by 2018. So that's what architecture does for you, is that this will be done when I think when I'm 50. Um, OK, one more story and one more project. So this is the most recent fairy tale. Um, and this is also a Grimm Brothers fairy tale called The Juniper Tree. Um, and this, <laughs> this story involves um, uh, a mother killing stepson and then feeding it to the father. <laughs> um, so again, I, I'm, I'm, I've told my sister that she's, gotta, she's gonna have to send me different stories um, because I can't do this anymore. Um, she's gonna have to send me something like with like a gingerbread house or something that I can draw. Um, but again, it was a challenge because this became about, this actually became something very much about drawing. It wasn't about form making. It wasn't about like the passage of light through something. It was about, how to draw something, and in particular, how to draw something now that we have machines that automate our drawings, which I have some very significant problems with, and I also have some, a very significant fascination with, um, as kind of a, as someone who loves technology, but who also sees the risks of overusing it. Um, and so this story um, is, is about, again, about this, this stepmother who, who kills her stepson, um, and the stepson somehow morphs into the shape of a bird um, and then exacts revenge on his stepmother. So it was about drawing the story, quite literally drawing the story, using a different way to draw. So this is the quote from the story. Then it seemed to her, it's a very long story, then it seemed to her as if she were forced to say to him, come with me. And she opened the lid of the chest and said, take out an apple for thyself. And while the little boy was stooping inside, the devil prompted her, and crash, she shut the lid down, and his head flew off and fell among the red apples. Then she was overwhelmed with terror and thought, if I could make them think that it was not done by me. So she went upstairs to her room and to her chest of drawers and took a white handkerchief out of the top drawer 
and set the head on the neck again and folded the handkerchief so that nothing could be seen. And she set him on a chair in front of the door and put the apple in his hand. So this is a drawing of the juniper tree, one of the elements from the story. So I picked elements from the story, and then I traced them in Adobe Illustrator. Um, and I played with the settings in this trace function, which many of you probably know about, um, about how to manipulate the image of the original tree. So some of these images I found on the internet. Some of them were photographs that I took myself. Um, and I traced them to try to figure out what the trace tool did to lines or to photographs. And so this is a close-up of the image of the juniper tree. This is, uh, God, you guys are going to think I'm so weird. This is, this is a picture of my son, um, but then turned into, I love my son, um, turned into the decapitated boy um, lying on the grass. This is a picture of him lying on the grass at a soccer game. Um, a picture of a daisy, which is another element of the story. And again, changing the settings on the trace tool, the, number, the type of curves or intersections, and I still don't kind of understand it. The handkerchief that the, the stepmother uses to piece together the boy. This is the millstone that the bird that the boy morphs into carries to drop on his stepmother to exact the revenge. This is a close-up of the millstone. And so this story was really about trying to figure out how to draw, sort of teaching myself a new tool, and also do it through storytelling. And so the last project. And this is a project that I did with my sister, but she didn't get to tell me to draw a dead kid or or something. This, in fact, was something that we really worked on. This was a real, a real labor of love, um, to use a kind of tired phrase. Um, and this is a project that we just found out, to having just sat in Ian's studio and told them about the risks of entering or the, the unlikelihood of winning competitions. That we just found out that we didn't win because there were 500 entries. I don't think we won because there were 500 entries. I don't think we won because there were probably better entries. But competitions are hard to win. But this was a competition for the Hans Christian Andersen Museum in a small town in Denmark, his birth town. And so we saw this late last year, and I thought, we have to do this. We, we draw fairy tales. My sister's a fairy tale expert. We have to do this, this project. Um, and it was just a, a totally great experience to work with my sister, who actually could, instead of just simply analyzing fairy tales, she could actually provide us with background information that would then inform architecture. So beginnings of sketches that I did in, in kind of whimsical fashion, thinking about what this building could be, a black box with color. This is a child's technique of drawing where you draw with crayon, and then you scrape away black crayon to reveal an image below, thinking if a building could come out of that kind of whimsy. Um, other sketches and models about this, this building, which would hold a theater for the performance and the construction of fairy tale settings by, by children, as well as elements from the life of Hans Christian Andersen. So my sister, who is uh, just a, a completely amazing scholar, did this research where she read every single one, she and one of her assistants read every single one of Anderson's stories that had been translated into English. And with a designer in New York, a graphic designer collaborating, we created this motif matrix. So this is the, the, the chronological um, chart of Anderson's stories converted, uh, translated to English, and then they, Kate and Sarah assigned, they identified elements from stories, whether they were um, people or animals, uh, they were materials, or they were literary techniques. And we traced them kind of chronologically through Anderson's stories. So we had to make this into architecture. So what we did was we identified a series of recurrent elements, recurrent themes, and tried to make a building that engaged some of the ideas that Anderson had engaged in his storytelling. And so the building um, started out as a flower. Flowers were highly prevalent in his stories, and the building quite literally became a kind of a series of petals on the site. Um, a daisy, the national, actually the Marguerite daisy is the national flower of Denmark. Um, and we might have won, not won because this is so obvious too to them, um, that they knew we weren't from Denmark. Um, geometrically abstracted and then rotated by program, and then oriented to the city. So different areas uh, of the petals are on different layers, and they become different programmatic spaces, theaters, uh, the shop, entries, galleries. And there was also an idea in this building that the storytelling, that the way that you curate the, 
the life of Anderson shouldn't be linear because themes recur over time and they don't recur straightforwardly. Some happen here, some happen here in his life. That in fact, that the way that you would program a, a museum and what they have now is a straight chronological, the life of Anderson. You walk in and it's 1848. And you go to the next room and it's 1850s, then it's the 1870s. And they tell his life through the objects of his life in a very linear fashion. And our thought was in fact that the museum should be much more programmable, that they could actually program the museum based on themes or elements as opposed to on chronology. And so the building becomes centrally focused around a communal space, but non-linear. Also, elements like the garden, birds, houses, and flowers were prevalent. So the garden on the north side, I'm hesitant to use this again, became a birdhouse garden, so quite with flowers and trees. The building from the main street, which is a, going to be a light rail trolley. Um, so you kind of carve your way in through these cuts in the building. A drawing of the kind of birdhouse garden and then a rendering of that space on the interior side of the museum. The idea of the cladding is that the surrounding buildings are quite colorful. The context of Odin's is, is very vibrant. That in fact color is another element that shows up quite a lot in his stories, but so does, so does darkness and death actually. And so in fact one side of this, this was a series of slats. On one side it was painted black. On the other side a series of angled mirrors which would reflect the surroundings. So you end up with this kind of striation and this striping of color. And then a theater in which they, the children actually perform and design the stage set. So on the far side of the right, the right side of the image, uh, a workshop, where, an open workshop where they make the sets and then a theater. And they choose a play, they choose a story every year. So we put in The Princess and the Pea, another one of his famous stories. The central core, again, you kind of go into the the kind of the middle of the flower, and then you work your way out to the galleries. And galleries which are below grade, you can see this, the wall of the building above, open to the sky, another theme of his stories. But a gallery which, say, would be programmed around flowers, as opposed to around the 1860s. And then lastly, the image of the building as you approach it. So this was a kind of, um, I guess, the final, this is one of the most recent projects, and it was actually the moment where I was able to, with my sister, kind of take this idea of story and actually manifest it in terms of architecture. Um, so I'm not sure what comes next um, in terms of buildings or in terms of stories, um, but I, I hope they give me the chance to kind of wrap things together like this project did. So thank you. Yeah. If, there so if there's any questions, let's use a microphone so we can record it. Thank you very much. I uh, really enjoyed uh, looking at your work, and uh, it was very inspiring and uh, kind of liberating in some respects. Uh, I guess there are two questions I have. Um, I think when any of us, the, the first with the Rudolph house, mm -hmm. or, um, when any of us add on to a house or remodel it, um, I suppose there are probably three attitudes. One is to extend the vocabulary that exists. Uh, the other is to contrast with it. The other was to sort of have a conversation between the, the two. And I wonder if you could explain, maybe you could go back to the slides, exactly what you were trying to do. Or was it one of those three attitudes or, or, or a third one? And then I had a second follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could go back one, I think. No, I know, I'm trying. Well, okay, so that's an excellent question. Um, it was a lot of one, so evoking, or uh, in places doing just what Rudolph had done previously, because there were moments of connection where we actually had to re-splice things together. So we didn't have latitude to kind of reinvent. But then there were moments where stuff had been completely voided. We actually kind of knew what was there, but it either didn't function because of new layouts. There had been plumbing, I forgot to mention that a lot of plumbing stacks had been run already. So we had some choice, but kind of minimal choice about where certain things could go. 
So there were moments like um, this here. This is a sink which is open to a space below. So that was brand new. And we had to kind of invent our own piece there that pulled out of the language of Rudolph. So he had done these, a lot of these metal supports with holes drilled in them. So we used some of that to invoke the original architecture. But it, that's a completely new insertion into the space done by us trying our best to channel Rudolph which is not easy or maybe even that smart um, an exercise. And there were other places where we just had to put back what was there. So I don't know if that answers quite exactly, yeah. but it was a little bit of like put it back and also a little bit of uh, put in something new. And then how did you decide when to do what? I mean, was there some code it to usually it? Had, yeah, it probably had most to do with how much had been eradicated. I see. The more stuff that had been erased, the more we had to reinvent or, or invent our own thing that was like his. Um, and I, I, it's, a, it's an interesting one because, um, you know, we kind of wanted to do our own thing, but we also kind of felt uncomfortable doing our own thing. And I don't know if it's good that people sometimes don't know that we were there. Like there are moments when people are like this, Rudolph, they never mention us. And I think that's, I think that's a good thing that they don't mention us. At the same time, I'm kind of, you know, my ego wants them to mention us. <laughs> like, how do they not know that we actually kind of saved the place from, because it was going to be destroyed, right? And, but there are moments where no one knows that we were even in there. And I, I think that's a good thing, actually. So let the, the second part of the question would be, uh, since we're in a school of architecture, um, we think about history and theory generally, um, how architects secure the legit legitimacy of the argument they're making. And it seems to me what's fascinating about your work is that um, at some point there's, um, I guess I would say, uh, something, something a lot of architects are very uncomfortable talking about, which is their intuition, and that you use your intuition. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, how you see the uh, sort of ba balance between sort of outside um, constraints and uh, intuition in your work. There's, um, I'd say that there's um, a lot of outside constraints. That's a really good point. I, a lot of projects are driven by the constraints. So like the house in Rhode Island was driven by like setback requirements. Like that was like the first constraint was we, once we decided, once the owner decided that they were going to erase the house, we had to conform. And that meant a certain kind of object. But then you find the opportunity within that to express ideas. So there's in real projects that get executed, especially, you know, New York zoning is a killer, right? It's like here, do this. And actually, in my, in my firm with Jared, we always thought that was kind of a fun challenge, which was like, where do we find the, 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 the little crack to do something different? Um, so the constraints define a lot of the work we do. Um, there's a project that I didn't show that we're doing now, um, which is for a community center in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which is the highest crime neighborhood in, in, in Brooklyn. It's a really rough neighborhood. And there's a a building, an existing bank building that we're renovating into a community center, and they have a, a parking lot they want to turn into a garden. And we're putting a, we have to put a fence around it, right? Because there's security issues, there's crime issues, there's surveillance issues. And so right now we're going through this process of how to design the fence, because the constraints are that the budget won't allow much more than, say, chain link. But then when you look at chain link and you start to kind of do something that's a little more interesting than chain link, you get into a realm of materials that evoke actually architecture of incarceration, which for this neighborhood is a terrible thing to do, right? So there's a, we're, now we're like, we're being charged by the client to make a really beautiful screen fence. They don't have money to spend for like a really highly customized fence, but we also can't use the stuff that we as architects feel is a little bit nicer, like the stuff on the new museum in New York, which is expanded metal, because it has a terrible connotation to the people who live in the neighborhood. So we're now going through this process, which is driven by constraints, and we're trying to figure out where do, how do we design this? So part of it is intuition, which is like, is it this material in this pattern? Is it some other thing that we make out of another found material? Some of it is invention, but some, a lot of it's just driven by the fact that we can't use this, we can't use that, we can't spend this much. But that's, that's our job, yeah. Beautiful graphics. Thank you. Uh, 
I, uh, I was curious about the design competitions. You mentioned four or five of them, and some of them were short list, five firms. Mm -hmm. Were they typically paid competitions? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Uh, the Syracuse football one was, we got a stipend, which, you know, covered the model of the footballs and the plaster. Five grand, <laughs> 10 grand? Uh, yeah, you know, like about $10,000. Um, but again, that's like six weeks of three people in my office working on it. Yeah. Um, the Hans Christian Andersen we, was open and uninvited, so we just did that because we knew that that was going to be fun. Um, so we did that for fun. Um, the one up in Syracuse was, I think we got paid like $7,000, but it was split amongst two firms. Right? It resulted in a built work, so we ended up receiving a, a commission. Um, competitions are tricky. Um, I prefer some of the RFPs we've done for affordable housing now, we've done with developers and we've demanded a stipend for those to cover our costs, basically. We know that there's like a marketing side of things, but I've made a point of asking for something at least to not profit, but to at least just not lose money on it. But it's hard, it's hard. There are a lot of people who will just do them for nothing. Um, and I've done that in the past, but I, I'm getting less and less inclined. I don't think it's fair to us. May I ask another question? Yeah, of course. I noticed through the progression of the work uh, clearly, you stated you've gone electronic in '04 or so. Mm -hmm. um, the but your handwork continues, so you're sketching still, even when you're drawing all yeah. the photographs. And um, the question, I'm not hiding from the question. Yes. Yeah, I wonder um, is hand drawing critical to the, the evolution of the design, and can you go without it? Or uh, I can't, um, but I found new ways to draw. So um, I use this a lot. I draw on this. Um, I use it like a sketchbook. So actually, some of those drawings that you saw were actually done on this. Um, I use this to teach. Um, you can, there's applications where you can take pictures of, so we sit at desk crits and we, my fellow teacher, I take pictures, we drop them in, we sketch over them with the students, and then we email them to the students and it archives our, their progression. Um, no, I, I can't live without the, the sketch. Um, our office builds physical models, so we have a laser cutter, but we build a lot of physical models. So um, hand sketching isn't done as much by people in the office. Um, I think that's still like a vestige of me being a little older, that I hand sketch a lot. Um, but my students at Parsons do a lot of hand sketching and we encourage them to. So I think it's pretty important. Um, but I'm also seeing that it's not always, it's not always necessary, depending on how someone works. There are students and some colleagues of mine who work really well and don't hand sketch. They can do things with the digital that are, are amazing, because they can control it. So. More questions maybe from a student too. Um, my name is Jeremy, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Uh, can we, I wanted to step away a little bit from, you know, we've been talking about your architecture and your firm. Um, me as a senior, I only have a semester left. I'm very mm -hmm. interested in, you know, master's program. If you could mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the Parsons New School. Mm -hmm. You know, and your... Sure. Yeah, we're, we're, um, we're, <laughs> I wish I, I should draw a diagram of the school. The school's, um, Parsons is, is, is uh, part of a larger university called the New School. Um, and the program of architecture is situated within a school within the university. So it's called the School of Constructed Environments. And in this school, in which I direct the program, we have a program, a graduate program in architecture, a graduate program in interior design, a graduate program in lighting design. And we have hybrid or dual degrees across those disciplines. So we have a program for four, if you want to go to grad school for four years, you can get a master's in architecture and an MFA in lighting design. Um, and you move between the programs. So we have those three graduate programs and we have undergraduate programs in architecture, interior design, lighting design, and product design. So that's our, that's our school within the greater university. So the architecture program is three years, um, professional degree, NAB accredited, and we have about 70 to 75 students across the three years of the architecture program. Um, so it breaks down to like 20 to 25 students per year in what are two studio sections. So in the first year, 
you, you're kind of with this, you're, you're always with the same students other than the ones who are in the dual degree program because they work from architecture to lighting and then back to architecture and lighting together. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, but the first year is kind of a settled core curriculum. The second year you, ha you have choices in each of the semesters. And then in the third year you have choice in the in this fall semester and then we do a thesis in the spring. So after the first year, which is prescriptive, everything kind of opens up to, to selected studios. In the second year, we, we look at environmental related architecture, so like a natural system studio in the fall, which is about daylighting or water hydrology. And in, this, in the spring, there is a, um, a design build studio as one of the options. So you can work collaboratively with other students. And then in the summer, you're required to stay and build the project. So for the last four years, the students have been doing work with the New York City Parks Department on renovating spaces in public swimming pools. So they've built locker rooms, they've renovated a lobby and a pool deck. Um, and this spring they're designing um, changing, changing rooms and pavilions for a pool deck in Sunset Park, which is in Brooklyn. And then this summer they'll build it. Um, and then in the third year we have like a, we have, sometimes we have a visiting teacher. Um, we're a small school so we don't have, we have core faculty. Um, that teach. We don't have that many outside practitioners, but usually in the third year there's a spot for a visitor. Um, and that's a, a kind of, we do urban scale projects in the third year in the fall in the studio, and then in the spring you do thesis. So you self-generated research. Um, and it's a small program that we all kind of, uh, all the graduate students from all the programs sit together. And there's a lot of, there's like a lot of collaboration between the different disciplines. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a really fun place to, I mean, I sound like a cheerleader, but it's, it's a really fun place to teach. We have our, our, pract our faculty are a lot of practitioners. Um, so really pe people who are doing really interesting work. Actually, there, there are people who are doing work that's just astounding on the faculty. And since it's kind of close and local, you see your studio faculty, you know, you'll see them 12 hours a week. And they're out of their offices, so they're happy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, yes, um, yeah. I'm just curious, I want to teach one day, and I was curious, your designs, do you feel like now that you teach, they influence your designs in any way? Do you see the process of design? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, the, I think the best, that's, that's a good question. The best, um, the best thing I can say is that at Parsons, because there's this hybridized architecture and lighting program, that in the last five years since I've been teaching at Parsons, that the idea of daylighting has become remarkably important to my work um, at a level that I never would have had previous, I never had previously considered. The architecture had, you know, all architecture involves lighting in a way, whether it's artificial or natural, but now projects are being influenced by the people that I'm seeing in the lighting program um, and the work of the architecture students who are also studying lighting. So I think that it's, uh, it's, it's informed in a way by the environment that I teach in. The other thing is that you know, social housing, public housing, is something that a, a couple of us have done a, quite a bit of research on um, that I didn't show that we're in the process of doing research on and that we're actually now trying to pursue our, our grand aspirations, our, like our kind of naive grand aspirations are to try to get the city to think about how they adapt these houses that are in severe need. And so that's come out of the research that's gone on at school as well. So it's pretty influential. It's good that you want to teach. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.